All right, so uh, so chapter one, uh, we'll, do, we'll sort of cover a lot of the answers to the assessment as we kind of work through this. But uh, so you know, we spent last week kind of going over my introduction to modeling, and so here you can compare and contrast that to what Moorcroft's views are, and uh, and then hopefully then we can see how that's extended into some examples of where we're going here in the semester and start segueing into the convolute diagrams that we'll start drawing um, in the sort of next lecture and then in uh, next week when we start using Vincent, which is loaded on these computers here. So, so chapter one starts with monopoly. Why did, uh, did Moorcroft, um, uh, why did Moorcroft uh, focus on this game of monopoly? Yeah. Yeah, I like that answer. So, um, so the a monopoly. If you think about it, this is a this is from the monopoly patent. Um, actually, if you've been to the um, um, uh, snakes and lattes, I think they actually have this hanging on the wall. And so, this patent was from I'm sure it has a year on here somewhere, but uh, 1935. And uh, this is a copy of monopoly uh, from I think I don't know about. Android App Store or something like that. So it's, uh, and you find that the, it hasn't changed very much. Um, you can see that there are versions that are specialized and that the names change to say place our landmarks in London. But overall, the basic structure of the game is the same. Um, and, uh, and so it certainly is artificial if you think about this as sort of a simulation of a whole city. I mean, there's a jail with no policemen. So if you think about a, um, you know, a city as complex as this one, then this is definitely no substitute. At least that's what it appears like. It's just kind of a game. But if you don't have a model for how to operate inside a city like this, and you just need some way to sort of study how different policies would work, strategies for, say, working in the real estate market, then this maybe is a good place to start. I mean, after all, if you're just interested in real estate, maybe you don't need to know the inner workings of the way a police station works, but you do need to know that you might get in trouble and you might be put away for a certain amount of time. So the salient features of the things that you care about are included, and other aspects of reality are excluded. And actually making your system less realistic can actually improve the model. This is a great way to teach kids about something that you know, real estate, like re, you know, if you actually want to work in real estate, you need a great deal of education, you need continual certification. Uh, it's not something that's trivial. And yet, you can turn it into something that you can teach kids about through the context of this game. So games as models. And so this idea that we've got these simple models here that import salient features of really complicated systems that we're interested in. And in doing so, by putting that in there, that allows us to interact with them in ways in which that are very difficult to interact with here. And then once we learn something from these, then hopefully we can then bring back some of our insight into things that we study over here in the real system. And so that's kind of the essence of, of these models, is that they're supposed to be simpler than the real system. If they were as complicated as the real system, then we wouldn't get any insight out of it. So we take away everything but what we need, work with that, and then we get a new idea. And that new idea might be wrong, because maybe we took too much away. So then we have to go back and actually work in the real system. So this these models are more about updating what we think so that we know the next action so that we can experiment on even more complicated models. So we'll get sort of the impression here that even a city can be a model for understanding cities, but we sometimes have to start with something as simple as a monopoly game. So with that in mind, like, so this is a cartoon I don't think um, Moorcroft had, but 
uh, you know, about metaphors. And so as a picture is worth a thousand words, a metaphor is worth a thousand pictures. And you've got this picture here where uh, this person's sitting there with uh, a knife in the back. You know, he's been stabbed in the back. And the doctor says, good news, the test results show it's just a metaphor. So here, so he was told he was stabbed in the back. And, uh, and here it's saying, well, you weren't actually stabbed in the back, but we're using the mental model of being stabbed in the back as a metaphor for what actually happened uh, to you. So uh, this, even though there's absolutely nothing uh, that is, like when people say they've been stabbed in the back, they usually have, there's nothing even close to that, but they understand that what that meant is while they were maybe not, uh, not available to speak up, uh, not available to guard against certain things, then someone ended up doing something at their cost to the other person's benefit when maybe they trusted that person. And so that, you know, it's a very, it's a powerful metaphor. So metaphors as models. And so there's another metaphor that, uh, that we can use here as spectrum. So people use this term a, as a spectrum to mean a continuous sequence or range. You have a wide spectrum of interests opposite ends of the political spectrum. But the word spectrum, if we were to actually sort of think about what do we sort of more, most concretely associate it with, people think in terms of color, you know, light spectrum. That light is, there, is no, there are no discrete colors in light, that light is a mixture of a variety of colors and you can smoothly move from one color to the other. And we have used light as a model, as a metaphor, and for us to communicate other things that live on spectra. And so with that, we can even put modeling itself on spectra, and this is where those metaphors come into play. So all of the models that we'll talk about, my argument is you can slide along this spectra where you've got a real city is a so-called analog model, it has realistic detail and scaling. So I can maybe, uh, you know, if I, um, let's say London and New York, we view are sort of similar to each other, and I'm doing something that is very specific in London. Um, why, if I can't work in London, I might be able to use lessons learned from people working in New York, because maybe New York and London have similar detail and scale to each other. So any lessons I learn in New York maybe aren't generalizable to say Los Angeles, because Los Angeles is a very different sort of city than New York but maybe New York and London are similar to each other. So I'm limited in what I can learn from New York, but there is a small set of things that match in detail and scale on which I can learn something. But if I slide all the way over to the model of, uh, that, it, that comes from Monopoly, Monopoly is almost a metaphor, really. It has no uh, realistic detail and scale. There's nothing that is specific to New York and so basically, Monopoly is where New York and Los Angeles intersect. Uh, whereas uh, if I need to sort of study things that only happen in New York and London, then I really need all of the detail of what goes on in New York. But if I'm interested in cities in general, then maybe Monopoly is good enough. And maybe Monopoly is better because there might be lessons that I try to take from things that people have done in New York that simply do not generalize to Los Angeles. But if I study lessons that I learned from something as simplistic as Monopoly, maybe it applies equally well to both New York and Los Angeles. So it's a weird thing. Getting rid of realism in your models sometimes increases generalizability and increases your transferable insight. So you shouldn't necessarily criticize models because they've left things out. Sometimes you criticize models because they put too much in. Because you can say that, oh, you know, like, you can't study that system and hope to learn about this other system here. They're too different from each other because you put too many details in. We would like to live in this class in the middle here, in this sort of illustrative area where there's plausible relative scaling. And so we're going to build models that are maybe too complex for us to play out on a board game uh, with, you know, our nieces and nephews. but. Uh, they might be complex, so, but they might still be simple enough that anything we learn here might apply to a wide range of systems. So we're looking for those general salient features that cut across multiple systems 
and yet are too simple for us to wrap our heads around without the computational tools. And that's kind of where we're living there. So um, we're avoiding the large and expensive, very specific models, and we're also avoiding the small, cheap, and simplistic models for something in the middle, which is an ideal balance that gives us the maximum insight for the minimum cost. Just enough reality, but not too much. And that's kind of what this chapter was about. And that goes back to this quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. We're not interested in how realistic or how accurate the model is. We're interested in what illuminating insights it gives. Is the model illuminating and useful? That's how we measure a model. All right, so um, here is what I'm claiming is one model, Romeo and Juliet. So classic uh, play by Shakespeare involves a man and a woman and their families. And um, it has been remade time and time and time again, both in the period that it was written in, as well as in more modernized versions that have been kind of recontextualized, even though the script is maintained the same. Regardless of what you think about the writing, most of you at least have probably had to brush up against this, maybe in courses you took in high school or secondary school, maybe earlier than that, maybe in your free time. Some of you may have seen movie adaptations of this. Even though it was written hundreds of years ago, it still sticks around. So it, for some reason, is transferable. But is it realistic? So, uh, so we have to sort of ask, like, you know, why? Like, how many people actually know people who have gone through <laughs> all of the drama that these two have? Like, to the point at which one of them, uh, you know, fakes their own death resulting in the death of another, resulting in the death of the original one. That's pretty extreme. I don't know anybody who's gone through anything that's exactly like that. And yet, somehow we relate. Somehow, even though we didn't go through any of this, and we don't have friends who have gone through exactly this, we see what Shakespeare was trying to say. He has managed to capture our imagination and take the salient features of, 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 of issues, tragic issues that can go on in a relationship, even if we haven't had relationships like that, and managed to communicate it to us so that we can understand how he might have felt, how people at the time might have felt, how, how we might have felt if we were in that situation. So super unrealistic, but very transferable. So where on the spectrum do you think this, this sits? Would you put this, how many people would put this in the analog side of the spectrum? All right, how about in the illustrative slide of the spectrum? Um, okay, so a couple people, hands are going up there. How many people view it more metaphorical? And a lot more hands going up. I, there's not a right answer there. The gradient to me is the right answer. Um, there might be some people that actually have gone through something that matches this pretty well. But that's probably very specific cases and rare. And so there are questions, you know, research questions, for which this is an analog model. But my claim is that um, in most cases, there are probably not, not that many things that we can learn that are useful about reality that happen at this level for this model. But um, you know, some people say it's illustrative. They say, you know what? I actually do have a bunch, you know, I can think of a bunch of cases, maybe they weren't re relating to relationships, but they're just as tragic, and, and I can kind of see how all of the dynamics here scale pretty well and kind of match my experience, so that's why I'm kind of putting them in here. Where most other people might say, you know what, I get that when I watch that movie or read that play or watch that play, uh, but I don't really relate to it in any particular way. So I understand what's being communicated, but it doesn't really tell me anything useful about my life. And so maybe that you know, sits over here more metaphorical. So um, you know, no right answers, but I at least want you to start being, I want you to be able to judge models where they are here. And that helps you later on determine, do I need to bleed in more detail or less detail, because am I currently sitting where I want to sit in whatever research question I'm asking? So another example, here's a simulator. Uh, this is a driving simulator. Um, I think um, uh, Moorcroft talked about the driving simulators as well. Um, so you can see these are three different instantiations here. 
here you've got multiple people with screens in front of them and then a global screen in front of all of those. Here you've got uh, one person in front of one screen or one person in front of three screens. So uh, how many people would put this as um, an analog model of, say, racing? Okay, how many people would say this is more illustrative? How many people would say this is more metaphorical? All right, so in that case, we got kind of, we had a few people say metaphorical, a few people, a lot of people say illustrative, and a couple people say analog. And, uh, and I think that is a very reasonable distribution. I mean, if you think about it here, I think in the book, Moorcroft mentions that, uh, you know, in um, Top Gear, you know, a, a show about uh, uh, that with a couple of Brits that are interested in such things, and they took people who, uh, you know, had never, you know, been in these simulators, and people who had been in these simulators, both who have never actually driven an actual racing vehicle, put them in a racing scenario in a real car, and it turns out that the people who were experts in the simulators couldn't quite get the cars all the way around. There was a lot of fishtailing and things like that, but they didn't kill themselves. You know, they never crashed the cars. They just didn't quite get it right. You know, couldn't quite get it all the way around the track. Maybe not as well as an expert who was actually trained in that vehicle. Because it, so it showed that they would actually, even though there's apparently some details that were left out in this model, they were able to, to generalize pretty well. They still had a little bit more to learn, but they were, did a lot better than somebody who wasn't exposed to these simulators. So I definitely think it seems like illustrative is a reasonable place, reasonable place to put this. Um, if you were actually um, in an actual vehicle, then that definitely would slide more this way. Um, and then you can think about from ecological perspectives here, um, there's two different models here. This is a stock and flow model, like we'll learn how to, how to build this semester, of uh, a fishery that has um, not only the dynamics of the fish, but dynamics of uh, people fishing the fish from that fishery. So you've got ships coming out, ships, uh, uh, you know, ships being deployed, ships coming back in, ships taking fish you know, out, you know, catch out, fish reproducing. Um, so this is one model of a fishery. And this, I argue, is another model of a fishery where they've gone in and they've basically dropped a giant blanket around an area here such that there can be no interactions between things that live pretty much just in this top layer here um, on the two sides of the blanket. So they managed to sort of build a water cage um, around this here, and that way they are able to control the inputs and outputs of this system, at least uh, to a particular, you know, there might be some mixing at certain depths, but for the most part, they're able to control a lot of the mixing that happens up here at the top. And so uh, we can sort of ask, you know, where do each one of these fit? And I think um, if I were to do this exercise of sort of saying where does each one of these fit, we might disagree on exactly where to put the computer model, but it would probably be somewhere over here. And we're not quite sure how analog this is because it seems a little artificial, but on the other hand, it's actually real seawater and uh, you're not just using math, you're actually studying, there's a lot of stuff going on in, inside here. So it's probably somewhere over here. But I think regardless of where we put each one of these, we probably all could agree that this one is farther to the left than that one. And that's often the most important thing to sort of say, is do I need a more realistic model? At what point do I go from this model, which is effectively underneath it all a mathematical model, and say, all right, I've learned enough from that. At what point do I need to switch and test my ideas out on this model? And that's kind of how research goes. You usually start with the high level models in order to test your ideas out, get some confirmation, and then, but your confirmation is only sort of at this scope. So then you see, all right, how, if I were to specialize to a certain system, does it still hold? Do I, you know, and I keep going. This is just like, uh, you know, we talked about mouse models for pharmaceuticals or other things. You might start in the mouse because you can't go to the more realistic model. You gain confidence in what you think in the mouse model, and then eventually you pop up to human trials. But maybe before the mouse model, you had a computer model or some mathematical model. And so it's not one model isn't better than the other. The models just slide from metaphor to analog gaining realism, but losing generality. So we usually try to start over here and then gradually specialize towards application over here.
So we don't judge based on where you fit on this line, but we use this line to sort of tell us um, you know, the trajectory of our research plans. So are there questions about that? Does that make sense what I mean by this modeling spectrum? <laughs> How we don't say one model is better than another, um, that they both can be illustrative. A model that is, is uh, contrived as this one, or a model that is as simplistic as this one, both of them can be interesting. But the things we learn here might be more specialized to this particular area, maybe to this water temperature, maybe to this latitude and longitude. Um, whereas here, we might be able to generalize more, but we're leaving out a lot of very interesting details about, say, trophic levels and things like that that just simply aren't, um, aren't, aren't modeled in this simplistic version. So this idea of sliding in the realism as you need it. So I claim that of the models that we've talked about so far, this is where I would probably put them, just from last week. But you might have a slightly different placement. But my guess is your ordering will probably be similar to this one. And it's OK if it, you know, it's not. This is just the way I would put things. You know, um, I st we, we talked about you know, in that first class this uh, this traffic intersection. This is a model of what would happen if you just drew out the stoplights and what would happen with a congested intersection. Turns out, uh, maybe not what we expected. So we learned something about that, but we have no idea how well that would generalize to another city or even another intersection. That could be just a specific result only about that special case. Um, likewise, the Titanic, you know, very special case there. We may not learn a lot that we can apply to shipbuilding across, uh, across things. As we move more and more this way, then we get into things that are more and more metaphorical. We all maybe can relate to this, but of course, this doesn't tell us anything about the underlying physiology of emotion or even the mechanics of a bicycle. This is meant to communicate a generalizable idea at a high level. And then if we're to say, you know, we want to then further study, you know, why um, it is at different points in your relationship with someone you feel certain ways, we might march toward more physiological models. But, uh, but as we march more and more towards physiological models, then we might say that where this applies to both men and women, maybe this old he thing only applies to particular subsets of those people. And so we lose our generalizability. So with reality, we pay the cost of losing generalizability. So there are questions about that. Does that make sense what I mean? It's almost like we've got these conflicting things. As we get more real out, there is a cost of reality. Not being a realistic model is not a bad thing necessarily, because realistic models can be so specific, can be totally useless. Okay. So most of 212, we're going to sit kind of in this area. Uh, so ideally, when you come out of 212, I want you to feel enabled that if you had to, in future classes or in future work, you could move more towards adding even more complexity and get kind of closer to here. But since we're just starting out, then we're going to build models that are probably a little too simplistic to actually be ready for prime time, but they're good prototypes for the process. So we're modeling the modeling process in this class by, building sim by doing sort of simplistic modeling just to kind of show you how it works so that you can generalize and be, you know, uh, to other problems and then specialize to those problems and make your models a little bit more complicated. So um, in the book, we taught there was this special model um, from this world dynamics from this guy named Jay Forrester, who's largely thought to be kind of one of the founders of this field of system dynamics modeling, or SDM. And so Forrester uh, had a, you know, published this model, which this is the full version of the model drawn out schematically. But if you were to look in uh, detail here, there's only about five of these little boxes. So this is Moorcroft's simplification of this giant model here. And we're going to learn how to read all of this as we go through the semester. But the point here is that there were five kind of critical things that Moorcroft picked out across the entire globe, capital agriculture, capital pollution, population, and natural resources. And he said, with these 
five quantities, if we can just model how they are interrelated over time, then we can build a, uh, an idea of different trajectories <coughs> That the global uh, that, that the global system of you know the different trajectories of these things all over the globe can follow and test different scenarios for if our population increases, if our natural resources decrease, if our rate of use of natural resources increase, what's going to happen? And so his thought, or what he sort of found, is that if we look at this interconnected web here, then this web of interactions can generate very different trajectories based on how things start out and kind of what parameters are used in the web here. So these trajectories can't be predicted uh, very easily ahead of time. You will have to kind of build this model and let it roll and then see how those scenarios play out. And for certain what parameter settings, certain rates of natural resource use, for example, then you can see that as human activity um, increases, it hits some global carrying capacity, and then that causes human activity to overshoot and then plummet and collapse. And as it collapses, it's sort of following a carrying capacity that collapses more and more. This is like using non-renewable resources so quickly um, that you end up kind of overusing them to a point that brings the, uh, that causes the population to shrink. And then alternatively, if you change the parameters, you can get these other trajectories that look a little bit more harmonious, where human activity ramps up and then it kind of settles down and, and roughly kind of you know, levels off. And so Forrester said, look, this is a relatively simple model that we can kind of understand all the individual links. I put them all together, I ran this model on a computer, and I see that if we do certain things in certain ways, we get catastrophe, but if we do other things in other ways, then we get sustainability. And so his thought was this was a thought model for how to learn about how we might adjust the parameters of our resource utilization across the globe. And, um, and that was kind of this limits to growth model. What are the causal factors behind limits to growth? And you know, this doesn't just apply to the Earth. You could also uh, you know, zoom in on smaller systems like this, this fishery where you've got um, the, res the, use the resources being used uh, by, so this is a simpler model. It has a fewer components to the limits to growth model, but it has a lot of the same salient features. You're using a limited resource that has a slow renewal cycle, and if you use it too quickly, you potentially can get collapses. And lo and behold, um, if you uh, look at trajectories from real life as well as trajectories that come out of these models, you can end up getting very similar rises and falls in the amount of catch and then collapses um, and the number of the sort of the boats that go out um, and they can also collapse along with the catch. So maybe this even this is even simpler than the limits to growth model captures a lot of what's going on here. So maybe there's value in using these simplistic models to gain insight into what otherwise would be cryptic data. But there's a lot of been criticism to this. So if you've taken, you know, taken 212, if you went and took 325, which is a course that sometimes I'll, I teach, and when I teach, we teach out of this book. And in this book, there is a section all about limits to growth and all about how those who study resource economics are very critical of this simplistic model. They say that, that Forrester basically um, assumed that, the, that you can start uh, the, the sims in the 1970s or in a simulation of the 1970s and assume that humans are going to have the exact same activity forever and of course you're going to see these uh, catastrophic um, uh, declines in population and resources. And so there's the assumptions here are far too restrictive because the economists would say there's unmodeled responses, that in reality, humans might see that these resources are declining, prices would go up, uh, resource use would go down, and so on. Is there a question? Um, I got kind of a question. So like, I was like looking at this, and like, I was actually just kind of interested in like, the sources from Cash Class, but like, when we were looking at like, all these different like, healthy diagrams, and like, the different forms of models in this class, and like, what would you say that like, just mirrors the way that economics works? What do you mean by that? Mirrors the way that economics works? Um, because like, 
Right, yeah, well, yes, and, and I think that um, the, the big, I think in economics, very often the equilibrium concepts in economics are static equilibrium. They are, if the market has settled out, where is it going to settle out? We'll use some math to figure out where a, a supply curve intersects the demand curve. And in our models, we're talking about a temporal uh, equilibrium. We're sort of saying that does thing, do things settle out? And, and, um, and so we don't have a supply curve and a demand curve, but we can simulate the same economic processes that are going on for sure. And that's kind of actually the point I was trying to get out here is although there's um, the ec economists kind of were thought that Forrester was too simplistic, that doesn't mean that that these responses that they say that Forrester left out can't have been put into his model. Forrester could have added a more realistic understanding of how economics works, about how people respond, and actually had something that uh, was, was actually gonna look like something from chapter eight of Moorcroft's book. So that if you enhance Forrester's models that all the econo economists hate, with these responses, which you can model, you actually get a simulation of economics, of microeconomics embedded into this model so that it actually accounts for these processes. And so we definitely can use dynamical models to simulate economic models. Uh, we just have to have enough foresight to make sure that we are including all of those, those, pre those things in there. And so we, um, so we, can't, we don't want to just criticize dynamical modeling because Forrester didn't get it all right. If this model is not insightful, we can add in those components and marry um, economics and system dynamics modeling. They're not meant to be you know, mutually exclusive. Forrester was kind of over here, maybe a little too simplistic. The economists pointed out that they're too simplistic. Economists often use dynamic or static models that do not and include how things change over time. But you can bring those two together and build system dynamics models that are economically valid and study how these responses unroll over time. So that you definitely can do that. And that's hopefully what we'll get to. But when Forrester started, he was maybe too simplistic. And so in that case, we really did need to add a little bit more reality uh, because the results he had were interesting, but they didn't quite tell enough of the story. So we had to add a little bit more realism um, in order to get to this happy medium. And so I just want to add that caveat is that right now we're talking about Forrester and if you take like 325, you'll hear people say Forrester was way too simplistic, but we don't want to associate Forrester with all of system dynamics modeling. He may have kicked it off, but now we can kind of forget about the guy and, uh, and we can take it in different way, places that he didn't take it in. All right, so a lot of these, so in the whole book they had this uh, the, in the whole chapter, they started to introduce these stock and flow diagrams. How many people have seen stock and flow diagrams in your other courses? So a handful, okay. So, I mean, the basic idea here is that we are modeling things that change over time. Those things that change over time are these stocks. They, st they have a memory. So uh, things that change over time could be at one level at one time and another level at another time. So they're modeled like water in a bucket. And that's kind of why they're often drawn in this way here. And water in a bucket has got the things, the only way you can change the level of water in a bucket is if it has a leak, an outflow, or if someone is dumping water in, an inflow. And so we model how things change over time by building these networks of buckets so that the things that change over time are like the liquids and the things causing them to change are like the valves that are dumping more liquid in or pulling liquid out. And so these stock and flow models, we can use software packages. So the book, um, I'll use all of their examples is done in a package called iThink. And iThink is a version of a very expensive uh, tool called Stella. Um, you can download iThink, but uh, if you're a Mac user and you've used Catalina, the iThink that's accessible from the book links isn't going to work on the kind of newest version of Mac OS. So you're kind of limited to running it inside like a Parallels or a VMware or on Windows. But it still works on Windows. We're not requiring you to use iThink, but if you wanted to run any of the examples from the book, then there are resources online. You can find these links in the book. You can also find the links uh, in the course notes uh, so that you can download iThink. And if you were to do that, 
you can open up these pre-built models, and I've already uh, opened up iThink on this computer, and this is a simple fishery model, a simple stock and flow model where you have a single stock and two flows, an inflow and an outflow. And the way this thing has been set up, so I can go to this um, interface here, and this plots things here. So maybe I'll zoom in a little bit to make sure everybody can see this, because I want, we're gonna see these plots and how they annotate, I think I gotta zoom somewhere here. When I was doing this on a different computer, there was a very obvious zoom that I don't, can't do right now. That's a little better. All right, so, um, so if you look at this plot here, you'll see up top it's got these legends, one colon fish stock, two colon new fish per year, three colon catch or harvest rate. And if I hit run, the whole thing runs for 40 years, but every time I hit run, it only runs for the first 10 years and then it stops and it allows me to then rerun it. And you can see that these lines, they're not only color coded, which is good for this, but if you print them in black and white, the lines have a number in between them. And so this blue line is a one there, so that allows me to look up at the legend and I see that one is the fish stock. So there's 200 fish in the fishery, whatever units those are, it might be thousands of fish. And then this uh, green line here, um, it says it's got a two on it, but the fact that it's green tells me that this is also, that it's on top of the red line. So that two says there's new fish per year and three says catch or harvest rate. So this is telling me that the new fish per year and the catch rate are identical. So the inflow and outflow into the bucket match, which means the level in the bucket doesn't change. <coughs> but if I click run, again, then this model is designed so that after the first 10 years, the number of ships that are deployed to the fishery ramps up continuously till it hits a max and then it, and then it uh, levels off at a particular level here. Now if I look on the left hand side here, notice there are two axes and there's this little bracket up here. So the way you're supposed to read this is that the top number and the top axes goes with whatever we're plotting one, that's the fish stock, and these two numbers that have the bracket next to them share the second number. So if you see you know, several numbers here, you have to look at how things are organized here and things that have a bracket next to them say that they take that position. So the first position, the first number goes to the fish stock, the second number goes to both new fish per year and catch or harvest rate. So what we're seeing here is that the new fish per year is constant at around 200, even though the catch rate now is increasing. So because we're seeing an increased catch rate more than the new fish per year, then we see a decline in the fish population. In other words, more water is leaking out of the bucket than coming in, so the water level goes down. So then in the next 10 years, they just experiment by bringing the catch, or the number of boats down back to where it was, and that brings the catch rate down to the replenishment rate so that when they match again, the fish stock goes constant. And then from there on out, the fish stock will stay constant. And so this is those, the same plots that you saw uh, in the book. And you can either show them in this view or in the map view when you click run. Then you can see that it's animating the stock and flow diagram. So here I see that the level is staying flat for the first 10 years. There's 200 both in and out. And if I go to the next 10 years, then I see that the catch rate is rising, the fish stock is decreasing, and the new fish per year is staying the same. And so we're just seeing a different depiction of that same process that was just graphed over time. So this levels things out, and from then on out, the fish stock is gonna stay low. So that's a simplistic example of a fishery where somehow the new fish per year stays constant even though the catch rate is changing. But it illustrates what's going on in these stock and flow models. We just have an initial level of a dynamic variable 
and we engineer the flow rates in and out of them to change this thing over time. So this is a, you could have done this all in a calculus-based format, but instead we conceptualize them in this very physical, you know, buckets of water uh, perspective. But in the end, the math behind it all is the same as something you could model with differential equations. But we're not doing that. We're just learning how to build these instead of the equations and let the computer do those graphs for us. So that is like a basic intro to stock and flow. If you didn't get all of this, that's fine. Uh, we're, we'll eventually go into detail about how to build these stock and flow diagrams. This is just an example of what's going on, trying to sort of justify where these plots come from that are all throughout the chapter. Are there questions on how to read this plot, on what these numbers in the middle of the lines do, on how to read the legends, anything like that? So this was sort of, uh, on the assessment was brought up, I asked, how do we know if a fishery is currently at a sustainable outcome or a sustainable scenario? What do you sort of do? What do you know? And so in this plot, I'm claiming that, um, that the fishery from at least this point on is currently in a sustainable uh, configuration. Yeah. That's great. Uh, well, the catch rate up here, the catch rate was not changing, but the fish were declining. Yeah, in the back? Uh, the catch rate is constant by the uh, like fish population constant, so it's not overfishing or underfishing. Right, so the fish stock is constant, but what is making, so I like this idea that the catch rate is involved here. So we can confirm we're at a sustainable outcome because the fish stock is constant. But what are the causal drivers of the fish stock being constant? Yeah. That's right. So when the new fish per year equal, so notice these two lines are on top of each other. When the inflows and the outflows match, we know that we are at a stable outcome and we can sustain whatever the state variable is, whatever the, the fish are, um, for forever, as long as these two stay together. So whenever we see inflows coming, meeting outflows, and then balancing together, it's like tipping a, a scale. Is that if the scale stays uh, effect, then it constantly is going to want to rotate. But if the scale ends up balancing out so that it levels out, then we, we know that we're at a stable equilibrium and we'll be able to maintain this amount of fish in there. This may not be a lot of fish, but at least we know the population will be sustained over time. So that's what I'm looking for when I say, like, how do we know it's sustainable? The fish stock is constant, that's one way to say it, or the inflows and outflows, the catch rate and the new fish per year are equal. Questions about that? Yeah. Uh, I would call that a static equilibrium. It's static because there are no, at this point here, there are no forces acting on the fish. Sometimes we have this term called dynamic equilibrium, which um, if you know you're in a, a deterministic framework, these two terms, the, the, term, the dynamic equilibrium, static equilibrium are kind of the same. But what I usually refer to as a dynamic equilibrium is when you've got um, fluctuations around, uh, like let's say this fish stock was kind of, uh, was, was oscillating. And that, but as long as those oscillations, that envelope doesn't move, then I would say that this is, uh, that would be a dynamic equilibrium. So it's not ever sitting still, but it's not moving a whole lot. Just as long as its movements are localized and not drifting away, that's what I would call a dynamic equilibrium. But for our purposes in this class, uh, it's okay to just call them an equilibrium. Any other questions? I want to make sure everybody, because we're going to see these plots a lot, and you're going to see them on the midterm. I might draw plots like this, and I'm going to use this convention because it's the textbook convention, so I want to make sure everybody has practice looking at it, is that when we print these things in black and white, you know, you look for the numbers, the numbers correspond to the legends, and the big thing here is understanding these brackets, that you bracket these legend numbers together if they use the same point. Uh, on the y-axis, the same. So there's only two numbers here, but if 
these two didn't use the same scale, then there would be three numbers here and no bracket there. I don't understand. All right, so um, if the way, the way this has been plotted out, new fish per year and catch or harvest rate both use the same scale. So, um, so they both uh, you know, go from zero to 400. So um, what for to keep the axis clean, what they've done is they've put little brackets around them. And if I just read down here, like there could be 10 numbers here. And I look for the groups and the groups are kind of bundled together. And then, then however many groups I have here, like here I'd say I have two groups. One is in a group by itself and two and three are another group. That's why I have two numbers on this axis here. So the top of this axis has 4,000 for the first group and 400 for the other group. Mm -hmm. Is this just as black and white, then how am I supposed to know which zero is the zero? Like, what do the numbers correspond with the? Excellent question. It's all in the ordering here. So okay. this group is, is higher up than this group. So, if there are, uh, so that would mean that in here, these two zeros, this zero corresponds to the first group, this zero corresponds to the second group. Any other questions about this stuff? Yeah. So on one of the questions, it's, it's, it kind of looked like that we would expect it to be a divisional system. And I don't understand it to be separate. Separate groups? Yeah, so. So question eight, you mean on yeah, the Canvas question? Yeah, question eight on the homework, yeah, on the Canvas. Oh yeah, I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to look back because I don't recall all of it. But, um, but, it's, so I think on the examples we had uh, in the Canvas exercise, we probably had more variables than this. And we'll see more variables than this a little bit later. And so maybe um, let's, let's go on with the lecture. And when we get to a more complicated example, if you see what you, you saw, then just raise your hand and we can take a look at it there. Otherwise, um, I can see after class, I can bring it up and set it aside. Any other questions about this? Yeah. Uh, well, if you, not by hand, but, um, and the, the simulation tool that you'll use, VinSim, is a little different than this, but the outputs look kind of similar to this. But when I ask you to like, you're going to be definitely throughout this semester, once we get there, you're going to be building these, uh, here it's called maps, these diagrams, and then simulating the outputs. And the computational tool like VinSim or Insight Maker is going to give you these plots. And you'll capture these plots and then give me these plots but you're not going to um, you know, have to manually draw these things up. So know how to read them, um, and then know how to generate them with the tool. We haven't gotten there so far, so we're just focused on the reading now. And these are generally called behavior over time plots. So how do different, fact, different variables in the system behave over time? All right, all right, so. So that's just a little video. So um, stock and flow diagrams and what they're depicting. So here's a simplistic stock and flow diagram of a fishery. We have the number of fish in the fishery. And then these thin lines. So anybody remember, what did the thin lines represent? So here, um, this is like the number of fish in the fishery. And then there's all these other variables. So new fish per year is how many fish are being added to the fishery. And then there are these auxiliary variables, like density of fish. So what does this thin line here represent? Yeah. So is that just like a general connection between the fish? Well, what do we mean by connection? Can we operationalize that? Yeah. A flow. Well, it could. So the flow, and we'll learn to talk more about this, is, are these thick lines. So there's actually nothing moving from here to here. But there is a relationship there. So what is that relationship? Why do we draw a thin line? Um, Causal relationship, I like that. These lines depict causality. What we're saying is that when the fish stock changes, the fish density changes. When the fish density changes, the regeneration rate changes. When the maximum fishery size changes, the fish density changes. So these are like win relationships. When something happens here, something will happen here. So it's not the other way around. There's not a relationship the other way. When fish density changes, it doesn't change the maximum fishery size. When net regeneration changes, it doesn't immediately affect fish density. 
In order for net regeneration to affect fish density, it has to find its way around the loop this way. And so here we see a feedback, and a feedback is just a way in which causal links end up interacting to bring causality from the past into the future for this thing here. So this is emphasizing that there are, is a feedback here where as you get more fish, you get a greater fish density, which changes your regeneration, which changes how many uh, fish you have per year, which changes the number of fish in this cycle. And feedbacks are where all the interesting things happen in system dynamic models. You've got no feedback, it's probably something you can just kind of think through and figure out what's going to happen. It's the feedback that makes this hard, which is why we have these computational tools. So like in this particular case, if I zoom in on this net regeneration, it's not actually represented as a mathematical formula. They just put it as a plot, a graph. And that graph says that the rate coming out of there, which is on the y-axis, is a function of the fish density coming in. So as the fish density gets higher, the net regeneration rate initially rises, and then it falls. So when you have low fish densities, as you get more and more fish density, your regeneration rate goes up. This is a reinforcing loop. And the thought here is that as you get more fish, there's more opportunities for fish to mate, and so um, those uh, fish then reproduce more, increasing this regeneration rate. On the other, the flip side of it though, is once you get too many fish, then those new fish that you produce have a hard time finding any food. So resources become limited up here, and this is what we refer to as a balancing loop. It's balancing because as you grow the fish population, you reduce the ability for new fish to survive, which shrinks the fish population. So this brings things back into balance. And so we have these two things combined here. And on top of that, to make things complicated, there is this little kink in the curve here, which is what ecologists refer to as an Ali effect. I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but basically, the, what these little effects here, where you have this accelerating reinforcing loop, that acceleration represents that your uh, regeneration rate um, can grow more quickly with increasing density. So these accelerations create interesting dynamics. And in the Lee effect, um, basically without the Lee effect, this would be a straight line. So there were early models of fishery dynamics where they just put a straight line here, but when they bent them down, they got other interesting dynamics that came out. And that's why they named the effect, a Lee effect. Again, I'm not going to go into details of it, but it's just a demonstration that these dynamical systems models allow us to play with ideas that otherwise you think, well, why would it matter if this is a straight line or a kinked line? Well, it turns out that little kink totally changes the population dynamics. And so it allows us to play with these ideas. Now, whenever we see a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop, then we tend to see S-shaped growth in the, in the corresponding dynamical variables. So this is what we refer to as a dynamic hypothesis and fundamental modes of dynamic behavior. So what we'll see is as we start drawing these diagrams, we will start recognizing as we draw them certain little motifs and topologies that are buried inside our, our diagrams that allow us to say, oh, before I even simulate this, I would expect the behavior is going to roughly look like this. It's going to start small, rapidly increase, and then slow down. And that's what we saw in the simulation. The fish stock started slow, rapidly increased, and slowed down. If you have one of these, and after you simulate, it doesn't do this, then that tells you that there's something really interesting going on in the system. Because we, here, we kind of know, what, you know why this happens. So if it doesn't happen, then that means that there's additional links that are preventing this from happening, and that deserves looking more into. So we use these theories to help us focus on different parts of the diagram, so we, under, so we can figure out how different parts, certain parts work, and which parts deserve more insight, uh, maybe through more experimentation. So, um, so this, again, we'll get this, this is kind of getting more advanced as we go on down the semester, we'll get into these in more detail, but I'm just trying to show that if you've got 
um, that there's all of these different motifs that generate different behaviors over time that we can kind of guess the rough shape if we know what to look for when we draw the diagram. And some of you may have seen some of these things in like a system thinking course, for example. How many people, I mean, certainly logistic growth, hopefully you remember from um, SOS 101, but how many people have generally seen um, you know, something like this? Like if you have uh, a reinforcing vector balancing loop with a delay, you get oscillations. How, ma what how many people think that th th this sounds like something that they've seen before in other courses? Okay, good, right. So we're gonna try to get to that in more detail in this course. Why does that happen? What are the various ways that these things can happen? And what can we do to mitigate the negative effects of these things happening? All right, so there are, um, you know, if I was to go and run this thing in I think I could run this thing here, then I'd end up getting this curve that came out of here. So if you were to download I think and download uh, this natural fishery from the book's uh, support site, then you can hit run and you would get exactly the curve that came out of the book. Now, to add a little more realism, what they did is they connected a model of ships coming out to sea. And so these ships, there's some investment decision about purchasing ships every year. There's some decision about how many ships are moved to harbor. And so we keep track of how many ships are at sea and how many ships are just sitting idly at the harbor. Now, this is probably an overly simplistic model because ships just don't go to the harbor to die. You probably can move them back over here. But it's kind of showing that there's this natural progression where they sit here and then they get harbored and then they stay there for the rest of their lives. But we can kind of see, at least to some extent, how the purchase of new ships will have an effect on the amount of catch and thus on the fish population. So we're gradually seeing this web of interconnections that Forrester talked about that is showing us how decisions in one part of the system are going to affect decisions in another part of the system. And, um, and if we were to simulate these things, um, then we find that there's this important quantity here that ecologists call a functional response. And so in the first half of the book, Moorcraft says that the effect, the uh, first half, uh, half of the chapter, the effect of fish density on catch per ship looks like this curve. In other words, as fish density increases, you get an initial rapid um, increase in catch. But after a critical density, say around here, then increases in density don't really increase the catch rate very much. And so um, what was one of the psychological problems that Moorcroft said happened? If this is the case, what did Moorcroft say could potentially be um, difficult about convincing fishermen to conserve? Do you remember this kind of nuance? Yeah. Is there a nonlinear I mean nonlinear linearity of the fish has made it difficult for people to understand the time scale with the the biological linear belt or scaling? Exactly, right. That as you needed fish density to get to really dangerous levels before anybody would even notice a difference in their catch. Now, and he said, hypothetically, what if we replace that function with what's called a type one functional response, where there is a direct linear relationship between fish density and catch rate. In that case, then fishermen could immediately see the decrease in catch rate. And that might actually make your sustainability argument easier to sell. Um, so, uh, you know, you can experiment with these different, so this is me just sort of uh, explaining in diagrams what I just said. And what we see is that even without the psychological effects, when you have a type one functional response in this type of system, then it is very easy to get yourself into a collapsing, um, into going across what's called a tipping point, which we'll return to in a later lecture. But, um, but the big point of this chapter is not so much to focus on what's going on in this functional response, uh, but to show that Something so simple as changing a, pr a pattern like this, it's not clear to our minds how it's gonna change, but we can unroll these dynamical models, and it turns out by switching to that, we can actually restore sustainability to our model of our fishery. So it just goes to show that, that although we have a hard time initially wrapping our heads around whatever the effect of this is, we can very quickly go into a program like I think and run it 
and then we end up seeing that we get very different outcomes. And that tells us that maybe we need to regulate catch to sort of make sure things stay in a roughly linear region of this functional response as one example. So again, I don't want to go into the details because we'll get into more details with the fishery as we move on. The big part of this chapter is how we can use these tools to explore these effects. So that's kind of where I want to leave it. Are there questions for the chapter stuff? In that case, um, so announcements. Um, we'll use an assignment using VinSim. We'll be coming up in lecture B2. There's VinSim on all of these computers. I just ran it. Um, to make sure that it's working. Uh, if you have laptops, feel free to bring them into class with VinSim installed on them. Um, otherwise, there's a Muddy's Point coming up and you can start reading chapter two. It'll be due before lecture B3. So that's not until next week. But um, so we'll start uh, introducing causal loop diagrams and how to draw them coming up here. The attendance exercise. So you can either go to the QR code or go to that URL. And under question one, you just have to fill out question one. Um, Let's uh, say, um, what do the thin links in a stock and flow diagram represent? The thin arrows. If you can summarize it in two words or three words, that's fine. And then submit that, and then that's all I've got for you today. And if you don't have a digital, uh, you can just submit this on paper to me as well. Yeah. Pardon? Oh, uh, yeah. What do the thin links on a stock and flow diagram represent? The thin Not the thick ones. Sure. 